Hello, it's Scott Manley here. 50 years ago, NASA's signature Apollo campaign had finished placing men on the moon. And these images, of course, have remained burned into our psyche for, you know, the time since. And, you know, if you've looked at these, you've probably noticed that this lunar module doesn't look like it's been built for billions of dollars. It looks like it's made of foil and a bit of cardboard and bits like this. And, well, in this case it is, because it's a replica at the you know, Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, which I was at a you know, couple of months ago for ThinkerCon. But it broadly captures the effect that spacecraft designed for deep space commonly have this kind of gold-colored foil on them. And while most normal people might wonder why they cover you know, spacecraft with gold foil, you as a, an educated audience probably know that they do this for thermal insulation. Not all of you may know that this isn't in fact gold foil, it's actually a multi-layer insulation and the colour doesn't come from gold, it comes from the Kapton uh, plastic that is being used. So let's go back to basics, right? Thermal control in spacecraft is incredibly important. You have a number of complex components which have a range of operating temperatures and you want to keep them within that range, whether they be fuel tanks that can't get too cold or electronics that can't get too hot or humans that don't like either. You need to design your spacecraft to handle all these conditions. So you will have heaters that maybe warm things up. You will have radiators like these on the space station that help cool things down. But ideally, you want to get the thing to the correct temperature and then stop the heat flow, limit that heat flow as much as possible by using passive thermal control. That is blankets. And almost all thermal blankets used in spaceflight will have reflective layers. Even if you can't see them, they might be under the surface. So this goes back to the vacuum flask, a, dev a device that was invented by a Scotsman called James Dewar. And he was really interested in liquefied gases, you know, things like liquid oxygen that makes spaceflight possible. Well, he invented the Dewar flask, or as we might know it, the vacuum flask or thermos. The idea is you've got uh, two layers of glass, there's a vacuum in between them, you silver both sides, and that does a really good job of keeping uh, your liquids hot or cold, depending upon your needs. And this vacuum approach lends itself perfectly to spaceflight, well, because everything's in a vacuum. On Earth, I can get rid of heat by conducting it to my surroundings, by the air convecting it away from my body. But in space, that doesn't happen. The only thing you have is thermal radiation. And, you know, thermal radiation doesn't do a great job of transferring heat. And that's precisely why vacuum flasks on Earth are so good at what they do. On Earth, vacuum flasks need to be made of materials which are strong enough to withstand the atmospheric pressure around them. That's 15 pounds per square inch, or one kilogram per square centimeter, approximately. But in space, you can use thin polymers coated with a metal to create a shiny surface. And because it's so thin, you can put many, many layers on top of each other, and you get what's called multi-layer insulation. And this is, image is an example of that material. Now, to make them work as good insulators, you need to make sure that the metallized layers don't touch each other so that the only way to heat transfer heat is by thermal radiation. So that's what that white gauze material is. It's called scrim. It's a very light separator, very, very thin. Because the thing is, it doesn't matter how far apart these surfaces are as long as they aren't touching. And so each pair of layers acts like a miniature vacuum flask. One of the layers will be hotter than the other. It'll be emitting slightly more black body radiation. It will cross the gap and then so on and so forth between each of these layers. Some of these uh, blankets will have like 30, 40 layers of uh, you know, this material. It is a microscopically thin metal layer. That's all that's needed to block all of the photons that are being emitted by the other surface or even reflect them back. And it certainly helps that on the outer layer, the reflective surface has a very high chance of reflecting incoming sunlight and has a very low emissivity for black body radiation, making this a great material. So now you'll notice that mostly the interior layers are simple silver in color. Uh, and so for the interior layers, they tend to use mylar coated with aluminium. And that gives you the classic, you know, birthday balloon look, right? 
But for the outer layers, they tend to prefer something which has higher thermal stability, and they use a different polymer. And Kapton is stable from cryogenic temperatures of liquid helium all the way up to like 400 Celsius. And you'll commonly find it used as like a shielding layer on electronic devices because it will handle those temperatures without catching fire or breaking down. And so when you apply an aluminium layer to this, you get the classic gold foil look of all these spacecraft. So for all you people that had dreams of being space scavengers, I'm sorry, but all these spacecraft are not in fact coated with gold. It's just the color of the aluminium shining through the plastic. Even the spacecraft called Global Observation of Limb and Disc looks like it's covered in shiny gold foil is in fact coated with multi-layer insulation colored by Kapton. It's not all bad news. There are a few cases where gold does actually get used because it's more resistant to uh, oxidization, but generally it, this is all aluminium and plastic. Now there's a few other things that are worth knowing about this material. First of all, because it relies on vacuum being between the sheets, it doesn't work particularly well when it's on Earth. Also, the sheets of material have to have holes in them to let the air you know, leak out after the spacecraft is launched. They have to have enough, otherwise, of course, the material could get torn apart by the uh, you know air trying to escape. Designing the blankets is something of an art, because to make the blankets, you obviously need to sew the material together, or in some cases now they use fusion welding, where they just you know squish it. And when you do that, of course, that means you're pushing the material together and you're getting thermal conduction, which ruins the insulating capability. Even attaching it to the spacecraft can lead to points where more heat transfer happens than others, and so this needs to be put into the design profile of the, this insulation. The other thing is this uh, type of multi-layer insulation is ubiquitous and even if you can't see shiny reflective surfaces it's very likely that it is lurking just underneath that fabric on the top because it's so good at what it does. But while it's a fine insulator it may not be structurally the best material to use and that's why you'll sometimes cover it with a more robust layer something that is perhaps more robust against micrometeorite impacts or your know, wear and tear with astronauts and I guess the best example of this kind of insulation in recent years has been uh, the case where a cosmonaut was attacking the exterior of the Soyuz with a knife so they could get access to the hull and see what the, you know, the hole was on the outside. And there you can definitely see the different layers of the insulation. And the flip side is that not every shiny foil that you see in space is actually a multi-layer blanket. For example, the sun shield on Skylab was much, much thinner because they it didn't need to actually like insulate, it just needed to reflect the heat of the sun. Metallized polymer films are an exceptionally low mass method for blocking the sun and making sun shields. So you'll find that in a lot of uh, satellites and instruments that are required to you know, block out the light of the sun or the earth. And I guess the best example of this recently has been the James Webb Space Telescope and its famously complicated sunshield, which caused the mission to be delayed for a long time as they kept on deploying and tearing it as they, they were testing it until they finally got to the version that works, thankfully. So all this stuff isn't ordinary everyday kitchen foil, it's high quality aerospace grade aluminized polymer, except on Voyager. Voyager had a very interesting situation where they literally apparently resorted to using supermarket grade, turkey grade, aluminium foil. Voyager's grand plan of course involved sending a spacecraft to Jupiter and to Saturn and ultimately ended up going to Uranus and Neptune as well. But while they were being built, Pioneer 10 flew past Jupiter and it discovered Jupiter's radiation belts and plasma fields Conditions which were uh, a little different from what they had been planning for. And so at some point during the production of the design of the probe, they realized that they needed to add extra shielding to a number of the electronics. And given a lack of time and money, apparently they resorted to generic rolls of uh, aluminium foil. Now, they had to clean this stuff down because the foil that you will buy in supermarkets is going to be coated with a thin oil to stop it sticking. And you don't want that perhaps getting into uh, your instrumentation. Now, to be clear, there was also multi-layer installation used on the spacecraft. It's just the foil was added for 
protection from like plasma and other things that could induce electric currents and it was very much a last minute design uh, change which actually kind of brings us back to the original lunar module because the lunar module originally wasn't going to have insulation on its legs apparently or it was going to have a lot less but over time the requirements changed the astronauts wanted to fly the spacecraft all the way down to the surface keeping the engine running after the contact light was illuminated so the design required the addition of more of this iconic uh, insulation over the legs while they didn't contain complicated electronics that might be temperature sensitive they did have like shock absorbers which might change their properties uh, depending on temperature so you wanted to make sure that those legs performed as designed Another relevant change for the lunar module was the addition of this plume deflector for the RCS nozzles because the thrust or the, the plume could impinge on the descent stage and potentially tear off the insulation so they had to add this and that's actually lined with an Inconel foil. This is actually used all over the lunar module and it looks like kind of crushed construction paper partly because by intentionally crumpling it a little, it ensured that the layers weren't perfectly flat against each other and therefore conducting heat rather than being slightly separated and only allowing heat to move via radiation. So if you look underneath this, the, the lunar module is of course a lightweight pressure vessel reinforced with ribs and uh, some other material bolted onto the exterior there. And so the crumpling of the material on the outside is intentional to improve the qualities of the thermal blankets that are being used. So while this crumpled crafting paper and foil appearance may look to some people like a shoddy workmanship, it is in, in fact a fine example of engineers arriving at the best solution for the job. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.